Miles, that was awesome. Um, we'll just introduce our panelists and then we'll get going. I'm Susie Spickle, Community Programs Director here at the Harris Center, one of the naturalists. And tonight I'll be handling questions related to mammals. Phil Brown, why don't you go next? Phil Brown, I'm the Bird Conservation Director and Land Specialist at the Harris Center, and I will be taking the bird questions tonight. Thanks, Phil. And um, how about John? Why don't you tell us what you do and what questions you'll be looking at? Hi, everybody. My name is John Benjamin. I'm a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center, and I will be answering a fungus related questions tonight. And John, will you also be handling some reptile questions? Sure. I can jump in with some snake or reptile related questions. As well. Awesome. Thank you. And Brett, how about you? What is your special team? What do you do at the Harris Center? Hi hey everyone, uh, I'm Brett Thielen. I'm the science director at the Harris Center and I typically answer amphibian questions at these Ask a Naturalist events. Thank you. And Jeremy Wilson, how about you? Tell us what you do at the Harris Center and what your specialty is this evening. Hi, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the director at the Harris Center and I'll, I think I deal with questions that are tree-ish in nature. <laughs> I like that tree-ish in nature. Karen Siever, I know you're out there. I saw you earlier. Tell us who you are and what questions you'll be looking into. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Pardon moi. Um, I'm Karen Siever. I'm an ecologist at the Harris Center and uh, I do a lot of different things, but I think tonight I'm uh, talking about green things, other autotrophs besides trees. Awesome. I liked how you called it green things. Last but not least, um, Margaret Baker is here tonight. And although she might not answer a question, Margaret, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for Ask a Naturalist? Because without you, I don't think we'd be here. No, I don't know about that. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Baker, and I do a lot of the graphic design at the Harris Center. So I make the pages that um, we're looking at um, look nice, I uh, size photos, I um, make the fonts work and just in general and really thoroughly enjoy making the pages come, come to life so that we can go through them and learn things. And I learn tons of stuff when I, when I get to do these pages. So thank you for sending in questions and photos. Thanks, Margaret. And thanks to everybody again for all the great questions. So we're going to start our program this evening. Miles, let's see what our first question is. Okay, I will read it. It says, I have been walking near ponds and rivers lately and have noticed many turtles sitting on logs sunning themselves. They are always in groups. And I thought this was because there was only a few logs available for sunning. But then I wondered, is there a social aspect to this as well? Do turtles want to be with one another? This question occurred to me as I witnessed 19 exclamation point turtles sitting on one log the other day. Is there a turtle expert out there with an opinion on this? I'm going to turn this question over to John. So John, um, I know you said fungi, but I know you love reptiles. Can you respond to this turtle question for us? Well, this is a very good question, and it's one that I will not pretend to have the full answer to, but to my best understanding, what turtles need and are striving for this time of year is warmth and sunlight, and that is what's driving them to congregate on these communal basking sites, which are generally logs that are, you know, uh, located out in uh, some outstretched areas of ponds and uh, lakes and they are trying to get sunlight. They're trying to, oh, you can't hear me well? I'm sorry, I don't know quite. Can you hear me now? I'm trying to talk close, is that a little better? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so my best understanding of this question is that turtles are negotiating uh, with each other to the best basking sites and they want to become warm, they want to be able to metabolize, to find their food, to escape predators. They don't want to be close to land because that's where a lot of land predators are located. So I believe it's not about wanting to be with each other like mammals and birds sometimes do. It's about just trying to get the best basking sites and kind of jostling for territory. But that said, there have been some recent studies with reptiles that have shown they have uh, more social dynamics than we have understood previously. So there could be subtle dynamics at play with hierarchies and awareness of constituents 
that might you know uh, speak to how they share these spaces. And I won't pretend to have the full story, but I do think the primary answer to this is they are all tolerating each other so that they can get warm and do their thing, finding food and staying away from predators. Thanks, John. Um, John, just a quick question. Is it true that it's turtles all the way down? Have you heard no, that? Matt, that's a great philosophical quandary, Susie. And I would say probably. I think so too. I like to believe it's turtles all the way down. All right. That's awesome. Thanks, John and Tony. Thank you for sending in that question. I've wondered about that as well. I love it when I see them stacked up on each other. Okay. This is a different type of question. It's a foamy sort. Walking in the woods today, in the rain, I came upon this. What causes it? It sort of reminds me of what you see along a rapidly flowing brook at times. There was only a few white pine trees along my way, sometimes at the base and other times in the crook of the trees, all had dripping water from branches above and hitting these spots. So Jeremy, this seems like it might be in your wheelhouse. What's causing this foamy stuff on trees on a day like today when it's rainy? Well, I think it would probably be on a day with a little stronger rain than we've had today. Today's been kind of a mild rain, but it hasn't really been flowing down the trunks of trees. And I think it takes some of that action of the flowing down the tree to create this. Um, this is exactly or very similar to what you might find in a flowing brook where you'd find foam that looks like soap scum. And you're thinking, well, what, where's the soap that's in the stream? But it's actually not a soap. It's just the fact that there's organics in the stream, organic material from the leaves and the needles and the branches. And as that breaks down, it releases surficants and surficants reduce the, the uh, tension, water, ten, water tension, water surface tension. And once you've reduced the water surface tension, you create conditions where bubbles can stay pretty stable. So we're all familiar with this in terms of dish soap or soap on our bodies when we're, we're in a bath or in the shower. And those bubbles are, real, are pretty, pretty stable because soap has surfacants in it, just like what's going on here. So imagine uh, in a heavy rain, water rushing down branches and then down the, the central stem of the tree and getting mixed because the bark is very rough, just like in a stream, it might get mixed because there's, there's rocks or, or logs in the stream and that mixing, uh, mixes air into the water and forms bubbles. And the bubbles are stable because they're surficants from, from organic material that's on the tree, uh, both from the tree itself, but from deposits from the atmosphere. So it's, it's a combination like that. And it's, it's, it's very similar to what we see in, in streams, um, sort of fast moving streams. We'll find a little eddy where there's, there's, there's a foamy bubble and it's, it's nothing about pollution. It's just that there are, are organics and surfacants in the water that, that produce stable bubbles. Wow, that was really, really cool. Thanks, Jeremy. And surfacants, that's the word? That's a word. Wow, that's <laughs> a word. I'll have to remember that in case it comes up in a crossword puzzle. Surfacants, cool. All right. Oh, I like it. Karen Seaver spelt it. So cool. Thank you. All right, let's see what our next question is this evening. A friend of mine found a salamander in her basement in early winter, and it was cold outside. Not knowing what to do, she has kept the salamander in a terrarium and plans to keep it until spring. Did she do the right thing? Anonymous, December 2022. Brett, um, well, first of all, I just adore this picture. Look at it. So cute. Um, can you talk about this, about salamanders showing up in people's basements, and do you keep them, and, and then what? Yeah, um, I get questions like this every single winter. This picture, I should say, I'm pretty sure this one was taken by Juniper King, who's one of our Salamander Crossing Brigade volunteers from this spring in Harrisville. Um, mostly when I get these questions, they're about this species, the spotted salamander, which is one of our larger salamander species. They can grow up to eight to 10 inches in length and they have bright yellow polka dots and they spend most of their lives underground. Um, they don't dig their own tunnels. They follow along in the tunnels um, that are made by small mammals. And so that's how they often make their way into people's homes if they have unfinished basements where small mammals such as mice or moles might be accessing um, the basement. Salamanders can access that basement as well. And so 
Um, the short answer is yes, I, I do think she did the right thing. If you put um, these animals cannot survive freezing temperatures. And if um, in December, if the, the, the surface of the forest is frozen solid, they wouldn't be able to make their way below that uh, freeze line to safety. Um, so it would not, um, not be good for this salamander to end up out in the frozen December woods. Um, and the best thing to do is to, is to wait until a warm, rainy spring night and to put them outside when it's um, kind of a day like today, rainy and maybe in the mid 40s after dark. Uh, one thing I also always like to tell people is that these, these salamanders are woodland salamanders. They spend their lives in the soil for the most part. So you don't need to bring them to water. You don't need to bring them to a vernal pool or another site. You just need to bring them to the nearest woods and they will find their way from there. Um, but in terms of actually what to do, how to keep them safe over the winter, I'm actually going to, I've, I've never done this myself, but I know that John Benjamin has done this. So I, I might pass the baton to him to talk about what do you do with a salamander in a terrarium for um, four months? How do you keep it well during that time? John, what could well, you share? Well, I got to say it's pretty easy because they don't need much over the winter. They're metabolizing very slowly. They're normally hibernating. I mean, in, you know, really having zero metabolism. Uh, so when I had one over the winter, I put it in my relatively cold basement, certainly not freezing temperatures like outdoors, but put it in a small, you know, uh, uh, spinach uh, tub uh, with some soil and some moss and some, you know, good uh, kinds of places to hide and stay moist. And I didn't even feed it. I didn't even worry about feeding it over the winter because it needs to kind of have that experience of pseudo hibernating and you know that's something that they can deal with when it gets warm periodically in the winter they don't necessarily stay dormant the entire winter but they don't need to hunt they don't need to move and i basically kept it in my basement checked on it every week or so and when it got warm in the spring i took it back to where the uh, person that gave it to me first collected it and released it back into the woods so it wasn't that big a deal and uh, i encourage you all if you find a salamander take care of it Put it in a little, you know, uh, uh, place, you know, a little uh, Tupperware or something like that. Maybe poke some holes in it. But even with that, they don't need a lot of oxygen because they're metabolizing very slowly. And uh, make sure they stay moist and have natural substrate. And then let them go where you found them. Uh, John, I have a follow-up question. Did you keep your salamander someplace cool so that it didn't warm up and become active? Like, did you yes, keep it? Yes, in... you know, so, so in my basement, it's not heated. So it was in the 40s, probably through the winter. Um, and that seemed to be sufficient. And um, again, this is my personal experience. There's probably better ways to do it, but it seemed to work well and it was happy to be on its way in the spring back where it came from. Cool, thank you so much. And Brett, thank you for answering that too. And for the anonymous person, um, sounds like we're giving it a thumbs up. Ooh, okay, here is an exciting opportunity. We have a poll for you. So we're gonna play a sound and then you're going to get to vote on what it is by taking a poll. So here's the sound. Okay, that is the sound. And here are your options. We'll see what they are. Sound mystery. What is making the sound? laser beam shot out from an alien UFO, chipmunk alarm call, male cicada from brood X, American toad calling a mate anticipating amplexus, Vespa trying to go up Mount Monadnock, and chipping sparrow with a chestnut cap on a spruce branch. So here are the choices. We have laser beam, chipmunk, male cicada, American toad, Vespa, Chipping Sparrow. <clears throat> we'll see about how we're doing on, if you hear some noise in my background, that's just my small dog begging for food. She, she is not a laser beam being shot out from an alien UFO. All right, we've almost, yeah, we're gonna play it again. Okay, it looks like we can end the poll by saying, um, well, maybe Brett, maybe you could talk about this. 
What's the correct answer, Brett? Looks like most of you knew that the correct answer was that that is the, the call of an American toad. They have this really amazing extended trill and that sounded like a single toad, but if you go out on the next um, 60 degree humid or rainy night to your nearest wetland, I bet you'll hear not just one male calling, but uh, dozens or even hundreds of them making that call. And it's really spectacular. It only happens a few nights a year. Um, and that's their courtship call. My favorite uh, herp field guide, uh, guide to amphibians and reptiles calls it a stunningly beautiful call for such a warty creature, which I always love. Love that. Brett, I have a quick question for you about that. When they're making their call, is it through their throat patch again? So it doesn't sound like what you would, cons like it doesn't really sound like a frog call, but they're making it the same way. It's not like they're rubbing their legs together like a no, cricket. It's, yeah, it's vocal. And they have, like you said, like many frogs, they have a, a, a throat patch that inflates and that basically kind of functions like a megaphone to amplify the volume of the sound. Um, some frogs have those patches not in their chin, but on the sides of their bodies, like wood frogs, those patches, if there's two of them on a wood frog and they inflate on the side. But with toads, it's in their chin, just like with spring peepers. And it's pretty amazing if you, if you actually see them, it makes the entire water around them vibrate um, because it's, it's constantly vibrating as they call to make that trill. And they must, I don't know for sure, but they must have some, um, like singers could probably learn from them because they can extend that for a really long time. So they must be breathing more through their nose um, as they're, or they're doing something to be able to, they don't take a break for, it doesn't take a lot of, they don't need a lot of breaks. Wow, um, really cool. And just quick, um, in that answer, it said waiting amp for amplexus. Do you wanna just describe or tell us if people didn't know what amplexus meant? Yeah, amplexus is the word to describe the kind of mating stance of frogs where, and toads where a male frog will kind of hook his arms under the female frog's arms. So um, frogs and toads have external fertilization. So a female will lay her eggs in the water column and a male will deposit his sperm in the water column. But in order to make sure that his sperm is the one that fertilizes those eggs, he wants to be as close to that female as possible when she's depositing her eggs. So amplexus is him kind of gripping her really tightly so that he can be, um, the closest one to her eggs. Thank you so much. And that was great. Thank you all for participating of those of you that did. That was really fun. And Miles, I really liked your poll question answers. The, the I like the UFO one. All right. Uh, this is from a friend of mine. Um, you know, as a naturalist, you get lots of strange texts and phone messages um, in the middle of your day. This is something that came across my text. It's from a teacher I work with, and this is her question. I'm hiking with my dog, Buddy, in the woods of Bennington, New Hampshire, on the backside of Crotchet Mountain. I don't recall seeing so much green algae and aquatic growth in the streams as I have this year. Are you noticing this as well? What is the cause? Is it pollution or just growth? So since this isn't a tree and it seems to be a, a green plant, um, an autotroph, I'm turning this question over to Karen Seaver. Karen, what's up with this? Should Val be worried? Well, apologies for having to have my video off. Um, I am in the woods of Alstead and even though I have Elon Musk's internet, when it rains, it's still a little sketchy. Um, so hopefully you don't mind the, the detached voice. Um, well, Val asked, is it pollution or growth? In reality, it's, could, it's definitely growing. Um, is it pollution related? Possibly. That's a little bit harder to determine. So what we're looking at here, if you see in kind of the upper left corner there, you'll see moss on a rock which is a terrestrial autotroph right there. And then in the water, the flowing water, you see a lot of kind of what looks a little bit maybe hairy. And that is um, most likely some forms of green filamentous algae, which are true algae. Um, this doesn't look like cyanobacteria to me, which is another aquatic autotroph. Um, and there, um, a little bit more of a concern because some of some, but not all strains of cyanobacteria produce can produce toxins. 
Um, green algae don't produce uh, the same type or even close to the same level of toxins. So they're not as much of a concern in that way. Um, what this looks like to me is a type of filamentous green algae that's called cladophora. I'll, I'll type that in the chat. Uh, and cladophora belongs to the genus Chlorophyta, which is a huge genus that includes a lot of what we call the true green algae. And um, what's probably happening here, it, well, how do I know it's cladophora? Because it kind of looks like um, green hair and also cladophora loves turbulent water. So you can also see cladophora in lakes and ponds, but um, it's often near the edge where the water's a little bit more turbulent because they this type of organism prefers a little bit more um, high oxygen aquatic environments and that the turbulence helps to introduce some of that oxygenation to the system. Uh, algae love nutrients. So if there's a nutrient pulse happening here, we often see algae and cyanobacteria respond to those nutrient uh, elevated levels, primarily nitrogen and especially phosphorus. So it could be that there are some nutrient dynamic shifts that's happening here where the nitrogen and phosphorus levels are elevated. That could be from uh, a leaky septic tank, that could be from fertilizer runoff, and that can also come from acid rain. So uh, there's lots of different modes of nutrient addition and we're really living in a world that's becoming increasingly saturated in these nutrients. And that sort of favors uh, certain organisms over others. So that's why we are starting to see higher levels of green algae and cyanobacteria in water bodies. And it's a really response to this increased nutrient profile. So if you wanna do a little test, um, I'll try to turn my video off on here. Find a stick and stick it in there and scoop it out. If it sticks to the stick, it's probably a true green. If it doesn't stick, it could be a cyano. So that's kind of a, a, an easy way to determine uh, a little bit about sort of what class of uh, green thing you're dealing with. Karen, can so you just a little bit on that? Just say that again. So if it sticks to your stick, it's cladophora. It's a true green. If it doesn't green. stick to your stick and it sort of slips off, it could be cyano. Could be cyanos. Gotcha. And, and that's something that's more um, concerning. And, yeah. it, and there's many water bodies that have both. All of these are native organisms. These aren't introduced in, in most cases. Uh, it's, it's when the nutrient levels change, lots of things that were formerly microscopic suddenly become macroscopic and visible to all of us. So keep your eyes out. There's going to be lots more green things coming to water bodies near you. Whoa. Wow. As long as it's not a swamp thing, right? <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That was awesome. A great answer. I don't think Val could make it tonight, but I'll let her know. Ooh, I know. Turkeys, man. I was in a turkey traffic jam the other day. There was like five cars backed up while we waited for this whole crew of turkeys to go. But this is a really interesting question. This is from Melanie and it's from this April. She says, I'm attaching a couple of photos of a very dark feather turkey I photographed in my yard on March 17th. I guess it, it didn't realize it was St. Patrick's Day. Okay, I'm interested to know whether you think this is a naturally occurring variant or perhaps an escaped domestic turkey. Phil, give us the lowdown on this turkey. Is it an escapee or is it just a color variation? Well, it was a good question for Melanie. And um, I believe it happens to be melanism, actually. Uh, and what is melanism? That is a naturally occurring, but still a very rare condition. Uh, that's a gene mutation. And uh, it gives birds or other animals darker pigment overall. Um, so the opposite of that would be albinism, or uh, which is the extreme example of leucism. Um, so think about squirrel color morphs that you might see, black squirrels. Sometimes we see a few of those running around and they can be common in parks. Um, with birds, it's more commonly 
um, the whiter turkeys that we see. That's a slightly more usual uh, genetic condition uh, mutation. But so melanism does occur in about one out of every 50,000 turkeys is the estimate. So super rare. And uh, thinking about turkeys, they're pretty well studied and you can actually count flock size pretty well compared to most individuals. So that gives us a baseline of, of how many of these darker turkeys is around. Um, difficult to get those numbers, but that's, that's probably the best estimate. Um, there is a domestic turkey breed or two that, that show this type of uh, exhibit of these darker feathers. Um, the ones that come to mind were the, uh, the black Spanish turkey, uh, and there's one called a, a Norfolk black. Uh, these are super rare domestic breeds of turkeys that were uh, brought long ago to the US, and they may be even more rare than the wilds, melanistic turkeys. So um, lastly, I, I thought this had to be a wild turkey just based on the behavior, thinking of how it fits so well into this flock. It seemed to be associated with this flock of, of clearly wild turkeys with their usual colored morphs. Um, so I'm convinced that this is a wild individual and a super rare find, exciting find. Wow, that's so cool. And Melanie, um, thank you for sending in that picture. I've never seen a turkey that color uh, morph before. So that's exciting. And Phil, I'm impressed you knew your um, domestic turkey varieties. That was very impressive. Oh, I, I had to look that up. I'm, I'm no <laughs> expert on domestic birds. So. <laughs> okay, um, so here we have, we have turn the tables. This is when we ask you a question. And our question is, where do black fly larva and pupa develop? And we're going to ask you to put it in the chat. And Karen Seaver, you're going to be our judge on this. The first correct answer will receive a Harris Center t-shirt from us. So just put it right in the chat. And as the first one comes in, um, you can let us know, Karen. We have some answers coming in. I don't know if I'm the best judge for this question. Oh, I can answer. Yeah. I, I got yeah. it if you want. Yeah. I do know this. this for, all right, I'll take it from my answer right here. Um, well, I really have to say, I'm going to have to give this to Carl because he was really specific. Pat was close. She said cold flowing water, but Carl's answer was cold, pristine water. And that's really important. So Miles, do you want to reveal the answer here? Flowing water, typically non-polluted. So that would be the pristine part with a high level of dissolved oxygen. So black fly larva, like many other types of insects, um, have can have a different um, habitat and life phase when they're in the larva form, like a dragonfly, for instance. See, the dragonfly nymphs are, um, develop in the water, and then when they transform, that's when they hit their um, land or air form. And that's the same true with black flies. Um, when they're in the water, they kind of appear to be almost like a worm or um, kind of black. They're often found in very fast flowing, very clean water. So I know this isn't going to make many people feel better, but if you live in an area where you're having trouble going outside because there's so many black flies, you should feel kind of happy because that means that the water around you has to be pretty unpolluted and clean. And as Carl said it best, um, pristine. So Yep, um, Miles is asking Carl to put his address. You can send it right to him. And I know, Carl, I think you've won this before. Maybe you could let Miles know we have other things that we can send you besides t-shirts, such as a hat or John Coolish's book or a tote bag. So you can let him know. Thank you guys for playing Turn the Tables. Oh, here we go. Here's a question for me. I love skull questions. They're a quiet break from the scat questions I usually get. This is from Bob. Um, and Eileen, a friend's dog in Guilford, New Hampshire, brought this home recently. It is shown on a regular size brick. We're thinking a fisher cat. What do you think? So actually, Miles, if you want to um, kind of advance the slide, I think there are some other great pictures. Here it is. It gives you the scale. And this is really important in terms of the scale. Um, when I looked at this skull, um, I did not think Fisher. And the reason I didn't think Fisher is that long snout. 
that made me think of canine. And you can really see that long kind of snout or nose section. And then if you look at the teeth and this, I love that Bob sent in the picture with it upside down so we can really see those teeth. You can see that it has um, molars. And then if you move miles, if you move your um, pointer kind of moving up along, you can see it has what we call premolars. Those are kind of the carnassial teeth. A fisher would have, uh, they wouldn't have the molars. They would just have these carna carnassial or premolar teeth. And then it has the canines, those sharp fangs that come down and then the incisors. So I didn't think fisher, I didn't think mustelid, I thought canine. And then it had to do with the size. This is a relatively very small skull. So um, the skull is, is fitting on, sitting on a brick. So it's small. And then Miles, can you go back to the first slide? I wanna just show everybody on that first slide. Here's another clue. Um, at the top of the cranium, the top of the skull, you can almost see a U shape. And that's diagnostic for this animal. This U shape sagittal crest um, on both sides is found only in the gray fox. So this is actually a gray fox skull. And I'm going to have to give a shout out to my mentor, Mead Caddo, because Mead and I spent some time over this past week looking at the skull and talking about it. And we both came up with gray fox based on that U-shape um, part. If it was a red fox, um, it would be more, the, that sagittal crest would come together and would just rise along the center ridge of the skull. And that would be true for a coyote too. And a coyote skull would be much bigger. So Bob, we're, we're voting on gray fox for this, which is actually a pretty cool find. If you look at it too, it still has some fur left on it. And that fur is grayish in color. And I saw that um, Francie put in the chat, can I let everybody know about the difference in the word fisher and fisher cat. And you might've noticed when I was talking about the fisher, I refer to it as a fisher and not a fisher cat. And the reason why is a fisher is actually a member of the weasel family, a mustelid, not a member of the feline family, that would be the cat family. So when we call it a fisher cat, it kind of makes people think that it belongs to the cat family, like bobcats and lynxes, when in fact it doesn't, it belongs to the weasel family. The reason it got linked with cat had to do probably with a long, long time ago when it was Dutch, when the Dutch were here and the French, um, they looked at this uh, fisher animal and they saw an animal that they recognized from home called a pole cat. In Dutch, the word pole cat was fiché. And that might have been how we got to Fisher and then Pole Cat got put onto it. And that's just a theory that I've read before. No, no, don't know if it's true. So that's the scoop on this skull, which I really appreciate Bob sending in. And that's also the scoop on Fisher um, and Fisher Cat. So, all right, on to another animal. While hiking on Osgood Trail from Old Stoddard Road in Nelson on May 5th, I came upon the snake. Is it a timber rattlesnake? Please advise. Thanks. This is from Susan. So, John, what's up with this? Is this a rattler or is this some other type of snake? And can you tell us how we would know? A very good question. And this is an important snake to be aware of because this snake is often mistaken for venomous species. And it is not a timber rattler and it is not venomous. I'm very convinced that this is a northern water snake. Uh, you can, the, the big clue is that little bit of red scaling. Thank you, Miles, for that cursor uh, indication. And uh, you can see that little bit of red side scaling on the, on the ventral scales. And uh, northern water snakes don't always stay around water. They're comfortable in a variety of habitats. You often find them around the edges of lakes or ponds, but they will be found in the woods at times. And they get quite large and they become quite dark at times in their older life phases. So a lot of black scales, like some uh, color morphs of timber rattlesnakes. Uh, I'll, I'll mention that timber rattlesnakes are extremely rare in New Hampshire at this point. There are very small populations that are uh, guarded as far as where they're even located because they don't want people to know about it. Uh, and they're probably genetic 
dead ends, unfortunately, I mean, from, from what I understand. Um, so you'd be very hard pressed to find a timber rattler. Uh, they're also mistaken for uh, copperheads and water moccasins, this species, a lot of times. But the best way to really understand the difference is to look at the head shape. Uh, venomous snakes will have much more triangular heads, whereas uh, non-venomous snakes like uh, northern water snakes will have a smoother gradation from the neck to the head. And uh, I will mention that northern water snakes are very aggressive. They will bite if you pick them up. Uh, I'm, I'm more than any other snake I've ever picked up. They'll, they've bitten me more. Uh, so you don't want to just pick them up, uh, you know, without getting ready for what's coming to you. Uh, but this is, I would say, a non-venomous species. Don't got to worry about it. They're a great part of our natural entourage of snake species here. They are, you know, um, very widespread and just, uh, you know, give, give, give it a little space and watch what it does, but you don't have to worry about it being venomous. John, I have a question for you. Um, when you get bit by a northern water snake, and I, I'm gathering from your response here that you have personal firsthand knowledge of this, right. um, does the snake have something in its saliva that keeps your blood from clotting so that you have kind of bleed a little more profusely than normal? Yeah, well, well, they do. And recent research has shown that a lot of non-venomous snake species, even common garter snakes, have uh, certain uh, chemical constituents in their saliva that do result in a certain mild level of envenomation and uh, blood flow. And there's a lot of chemicals that are going on in, in their saliva that actually do uh, help them with their ability to subdue their prey. Is it a big worry for us as humans getting bit? No, you can you can wash off your bite and you'll be fine. You're not going to get envenomated. But it's very interesting to sort of uh, recognize that the sort of distinction between venomous and non-venomous is a little bit more uh, complex than we formerly realized. And that even very common and harmless species to us do have some ability to envenomate their prey. Wow, John, that was so fascinating. And you used a word, an, another new word for me. I've, I'm collecting all the new words I'm learning today. Envenomate. Can you tell? Can you tell me exactly what that means? Because that is such a great word. I might have to use it in my language, in everyday language. I mean, I it's funny to think about the euphemisms in human society. But <laughs> envenomate means to uh, uh, <laughs> transfer venom from predator to prey, so that the prey becomes subdued or even deceased. So the predator can consume it. And wow. Do it, snakes do it. Lots of other animals do it. So cool. Thanks, John. That was a fabulous explanation. Super clear. Thank you so much for your snake enthusiasm too. All right, here we go. Um, this is a question I've been getting too. And I just love this beautiful photograph by our very own Mead Cadeau. Um, this is from Raymond and he wants, he says, my question concerns warnings about the spread of bird flu. I've heard that mo of most concern are chickens and waterfowl, but should I be concerned about bird flu in the forest with songbirds at our feeder? Should our feeders be taken in or is it okay to continue feeding them? We live on Barnard Hill in Ware at 800 feet above sea level. And this photo is not mine, although the indigo buttons, buntings do visit our yard. Raymond, thank you so much for this great question and what a beautiful sight. And Phil, I know this is a worry for everybody. Can you tell us a little bit about bird flu and what we should do? Sure, well, yeah, you, you can't get away from the news about bird flu these days. It's, it's very much in the daily news. And um, we've been getting a lot of questions at the Harris Center about what to do. So I'm glad this question came up and um, this should be a good opportunity to uh, give you the state of the conditions of bird flu right now. Um, this is a, a disease that is spreading naturally among wild and domestic birds. It, um, it started in the fall and at this point, um, we have certain a number of detections of dead birds, but it's, it's a really gnarly disease that, that devastates birds. So birds are going through their, their own sort of pandemic at this point. Uh, but it is something that has happened before and um, large poultry flocks tend to spread it. So domestic turkeys, chickens, ducks, anything really on a large scale is exacerbating the issue. Um, and as a result, it, it would be spreading to wild birds a little bit more easily. Um, so these mechanisms for spread usually happen around the wetlands and areas where waterfowl like ducks are congregating. Um, and, and you think about ducks that are a, a flocking species flying together by groups of hundreds or thousands, that's, that's really 
um, you know, that can be pretty devastating in those flocks. And there are some reports of, of widespread mortality in certain places still. Um, it should start to subside, uh, the experts are saying. Uh, migration tends to spread the disease. And um, it, it really began in, in the fall, but it's, it's still going on even through the winter and spring migration. Um, at this point, I guess the question everybody wants to know, should we stop feeding the birds? Um, there's always a question about that related to bears in Harbin Adnock region around here. Um, and that happens because the bears emerge uh, in the spring. So that's a consideration right now for a lot of people. And as a result, a lot have already stopped feeding. Um, however, the, the avian flu presenting a new challenge here, um, the, the, the real, there's no real easy answer, I guess. Uh, locally, though, we are advising to follow the advice of the State Wildlife Agency, and that's New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, so Audubon and Fish and Game should be able to provide the first updates if you're interested in what to do locally in our state and check your other state wildlife agencies for guidance on that issue. Um, so, you know, there's no, there's no need to stop feeding currently. However, be mindful that your feeders should be kept clean anyway. Um, this is something that a lot of us don't do as frequently as we should, but cleaning the feeders out with a bleach solution is a good way to go. It also helps stem the spread of the, um, the avian conjunctivitis that house finches and other finches are often infected with. So this can be another deadly disease that our feeders do indeed spread. Uh, so yeah, when, when avian flu does become an issue in the area, if it does, uh, at that point, we would want to advise stopping to feed the birds because they're, they're gathering at those feeding points. So uh, the downside of not feeding the birds in the summer, you won't see these, these beautiful blue gems like the indigo buntings and uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks quite as easily. I wanted to say too that Raymond did send in a photo of an indigo bunting at his feeder that came, I think, just this week. <laughs> so oh, uh -huh. that's when they're showing up, and uh, yeah, it, that's a great way to see them. But at that same time, birds don't need our food and our help at this point too. So it's purely a selfish act on behalf of humans to feed the birds right now. They don't need it; they'll get by okay. Thanks, Phil. That was such a great response to a complicated issue. And um, I know that I've had that question asked of me. So I really appreciate that, which is great. All right. Um, before we advance the slide, let's just let our eyes linger a little bit on this indigo bunting. And I wanted to just share, I know we get a lot of questions and sometimes if you showed up expecting that you were going to answer your question, sometimes we don't get to answer all the questions because we get so many of them and we try to make sure that we're getting questions for all different types of um, flora and fauna. Um, so, you know, we always have, we have a store of questions that sometimes will pop in at a later date. So um, don't be discouraged if you didn't see your question get answered this evening, but you can join us on July 7th for our next Ask a Naturalist where we might answer your question. And if you're out wandering around between then and now, and you come across a natural history mystery, feel free to send in that question with a photograph or an audio recording as well um, for our next one, which is July 7th. So I think this might be our last question coming up. Let's see what we've got. Oh, ha, huh. walking along a snowmobile trail, I noticed this jawbone and fur. There is a broad wing nest that I was investigating for a return visit and found this instead. The acorn gives a comparison of side. There was fur scattered close by. Who could it have been? This is from David in Allstead. And I love this because as soon as I see this jawbone, I don't even have to go to my guidebook. I know right away because look at all those teeth. It is a very, very toothy jawbone. It is the most teeth that you will find on a jawbone. And that's the key identifier. This is the jawbone of an opossum. An opossum has so many teeth. They are insectivores primarily. They love to eat insects, although they will eat many, many other things. But those teeth are really designed for crushing up the exoskeletons of insects. And that's something that they really um, depend upon eating, although they will eat many other things. Again, and it's good to remind us ourselves that opossum are members of marsupials. They're the only North
North American marsupial that we have, and their mouth structure is different than many of the other mammals that we have here on our continent because they are jump ship or stayed on our ship when the continent separated and became the sole surviving marsupial. You can see the fur. I think we have a good slide of all the fur on the next slide to just for confirmation. This is very opossum-like fur. It's gray with white. Um, it's sort of coarse and long. Um, and again, this is definitely a possum in, in, um, in appearance. Phil, I just had a question for you about something like a broadwing hawk. Um, that would be too, an opossum would be too big a prey for something like an, a, like a broadwing, but other aerial predators might take an opossum. Can you respond to that, Phil? Yeah, um, I would think broadwing hawks, yeah, I, I know they specialize in chipmunks and things that are small mammals at best. Um, Red-tailed hawk comes to mind as one that might be able to take a small opossum, I would think. Uh, great horned owl, uh, they can lift anything as large as a skunk and I'm not sure of the weight difference typically. You would probably know better, Susie. Similar. Okay. So yeah, maybe just great horned owl then in the local bird world around here. Yeah. So, you know, other animals that would eat an opossum include things like coyotes and bobcat. Even a bear wouldn't be, um, wouldn't turn their nose down on opossum. And as you all know, opossums have that um, playing dead as a feature, which is a great tool to escape predation um, from a predator who's interested in eating live prey, but can be problematic if it's a, a predator that wants to, or a scavenger that wants to eat something dead, because not only does the opossum appear visually dead, but it actually smells dead too. So um, who knows exactly what happened to this opossum, but that's my um, comment. Uh, it's definitely a possum jawbone with a possum fur, and that's going to close out our Ask a Naturalist oh, this Susie, evening. Oh, we yeah. Do, we do have... Um quite a bit of time. And I did queue up one more slide with okay. some guy oh, great. That, uh, that we have here. Thanks, Miles. This is a surprise. <laughs> and we're putting John right here. I will, I will read this question. I saw this colony of, and he question mark after colony. Is, is that what you call a group of, of mushrooms? I saw this colony of mushroom on a down tree trunk in my neighborhood. I was amazed how much they look like clams. Can you identify this species and possibly some cool factoids about them? P.S. You're all awesome. Thanks, KW. Thank you, KW. That's for May 2022. Factoid mushroom man. That would be John Benjamin. What's up? What are these all cute right, little we'll guys? One guy encore for Ask a Naturalist tonight. You know, you thought you were done, but you're not. So, uh, <laughs> This picture is a little bit small. I know it's a little bit hard to see it. I did look at it earlier, and I'm pretty convinced of the, of the identity of this species. I believe this is what we call false turkey tail, Sterium austria, which is, you know, as you would guess, one of the species that is mistaken for true turkey tail quite often. There are many, many species that are mistaken for true turkey tail, which has the uh, scientific name Tremetes versicolor. That's a species that is sought after for its medicinal uh, properties, and it's also a very common species. You always can tell the difference between these species by looking under the cap. That's what I always tell my students in mushroom classes, to look under the cap, see what features you find that release the spores. It could be gills, it could be pores, it could be uh, prickly teeth. There's lots of things you can find. In the case of false turkey tail, it kind of looks similar to the top part of the mushroom. It's kind of a papery, striped, sort of a parchment-like sort of surface. No, no distinctive pores or gills or teeth. So it's kind of a unique species. Uh, it's very beautiful oftentimes. It's, it's a very cool species to find, kind of, you know, like I said, parchment-like, but doesn't have uh, medicinal qualities. You wouldn't harvest this for any reason. And, uh, you know, it's just a little bit different from true turkey tail and violet tooth polypores, which are very common, which have little prickly uh, tooth-like structures on the bottom. So always look underneath the surface, and I'm pretty sure it's what we're looking at here, false turkey tail. Thank you, John. I'm just going to give a shout out to anybody who um, is um, zooming in from close by. If you ever get a chance to come out on one of John's amazing moral quandary mushroom meanders, which we offer pretty much um, 
all the time once a month, um, you will not be disappointed. Um, John is an amazing naturalist in so many areas, truly excelling in the fungi area, and he is actually a true fungi. <laughs> <laughs> Susie, exactly. you ask the naturalist unless you call me a fun guy and some uh, <laughs> phil and some others were asking what is the collective name for a group of mushrooms i don't know that's a good question i don't think it's quite a colony i mean maybe it's open for naming so if you all want to just crowdsource it and decide what a group of mushrooms should be called maybe we can just figure it out tonight something i forgot to mention when we were talking about that group of turtles does anybody know what a group of turtles is called I, I do, but I won't give it away. <laughs> I okay. Well, John, what did you find out? I, I believe it's a bale of turtles. It's a bale or a turn of turtles, okay. sometimes known as a dole, also, which I thought was really cool. But I like bale, like a bale of hay. It's like a bale, a b a l e, yeah. bale of turtles, and or this one is a very alliterative, a turn of turtles. So on that lovely note, I want to thank absolutely everybody for showing up tonight, especially all of the panelists and the people who sent in questions and those of you who spent this little bit of time with us. We always appreciate it. Hope to see you all on July 7th for our next Ask a Naturalist. Don't forget, forget to send us your natural history mysteries anything from photographs to audio recordings to videos we'll take it all thank you again and have a really great evening good night everyone bye <laughs>